بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد This is going to be a very interesting video. Uh, it is devoted to Julius Evola, an extremely prolific individual whose life uh, spanned both the end of the 19th century and the twilight years, uh, more, almost the twilight years of the 20th century. I think he's an extremely important thinker and deserves to be not only more widely known, but um, more deeply understood. And so um, I'm going to be going through all of his books just quickly, uh, talking about some uh, more than others. But this is going to be a comprehensive Julius Evola reading list. I have practically every single book of his that is available in the English language with the exception of one or two, which I did order, but they got lost and weren't delivered, but we will get to that. Evola, if you really want to understand him, you also have to understand another extremely important figure, and I've already recorded just an entire video about him as well, and that is René Guénon. So please refer to my René Guénon reading list, in which I also talk about the best way to approach the works of René Guénon. Uh, so that's almost a kind of, yeah, I would really say, it is. it is, it really is a prerequisite to understanding, uh, at least having a more profound, rather than a superficial understanding of Julius Evola. I also have a course of lectures in video form, which I'm preparing uh, slowly and carefully, devoted to the most important book of René Guénon, namely the re his Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times. And please uh, refer to the rest of my channel where I have a number of other videos and podcasts which I have devoted to Guénon and traditionalism since about 2020. So before we get into the uh, Julius Evola reading list, I would like to ask everyone to like and subscribe subscribe and share this video. And if you like my content and you think it's useful, please do seriously consider supporting this work uh, by becoming a patron on my Patreon or contributing via PayPal and all of the links uh, to all of that are in the description to the video. So Evola is a traditionalist with a capital T. He has that in common with René Guénon. They believe that there is something called a primordial tradition, again with a capital T, that is fundamentally metaphysical in nature and has a a, a metaphysical or an integral metaphysical doctrine which is independent of any particular religious faith or <clears throat> manifestation of a particular religious faith or spiritual tradition in historical time. Really the most important book of Julius Evola is his revolt against the modern world. So Evola, like Guénon, consider the modern world and modern civilization to be a complete and total aberration in the history of mankind. Aberration in the sense that the modern world is the first instance in the entire history of uh, human civilization, of a civiliza civilization which is not based on the sacred, which is not based on a recognition of uh, deep and profound eternal verities uh, of a metaphysical, spiritual nature. In fact, it is based on the complete and total repudiation of that. So Genon and Evola both um, are very much opposed uh, to this, and they also, both of them, subscribe to the traditional doctrine of cycles and the cyclical history of the human race. This is very much a doctrine that does not see time as a pure quantity or as the mere succession of events as they unfold within either an infinite duration, which doesn't make sense, of a some sort of a finite uh, duration, um, depending on which particular dogma anyone may subscribe to, uh, but they see that we are in the last cycle. Uh, Genon calls it the Kali Yuga. Evola also uses the term Kali Yuga. I have um, a whole discussion of that in another video. I think this is also called in, in, in the uh, Nordic mythology, I think uh, Evola says this is it's called the, the Age of the Wolf. In this book, he presents this whole idea of the revolt against this doctrine, revolt against the uh, the modern world. And naturally, my remarks on each of these books are going to be rather brief and therefore have a certain degree of superficiality to them because I just want to go through every single book. And even if that means just mentioning the title and speaking a sentence or two about it, but I am trying to go in a particular kind of order. Um, so I think this is absolutely fundamental. Um, Evola was intelligent enough 
and cognizant enough of his place in, in, in history and intellectual history of the Western world to prepare a, an autobiographical statement and almost a kind of intellectual autobiography in which he explains himself the background to each of his works and what led him to write them and what he was trying to achieve. And so I think that's absolutely fundamental to understanding Evola. And so that's in his autobiography, which is called The Path of Cinnabar. The Path of Cinnabar. This is an edition. This is, I think, an earlier edition, which I have published by... It just says Integral Tradition. So I think there's an, actually a newer edition of this by uh, another publisher called Arctos. I should say that uh, Arctos is considered by um, the uh, reigning uh, profane worldview to be uh, something of a um, controversial publisher. I honestly could care less. I read everything and I really don't care who is publishing what. If I want to read the book, I get it and I come to my own conclusion and I would humbly recommend and suggest that everyone else do the same. Um, so this is an extremely important um, intellectual biography and testament in which he gives uh, his own personal insight, which is crucial to each of his uh, books. Evola is somewhat different from uh, Genon. Genon is a purely kind of spiritual individual. That is his uh, fundamental, essential nature. If we introduce the idea of the notion of caste or a spiritual kind of caste and borrow that from the Indic or Vedic tradition. We have the Brahman caste, we have the Kshatriya caste, we have the Vaishya caste and the Shudra caste. So the, the Brahmins are those who are utterly and completely devoted to the doctrine, uh, to the performance of rites and so forth, uh, the so-called priestly caste. The Kshatriya is the one who is devoted to the struggle whether that is the outward warfare or the spiritual warfare, the inner struggle, the warrior. Then we have the man of the world, you know, like people today who are the businessmen and technocrats, you know, the merchant class. And then we have those who are born to serve, the Shudra. So if you accept that, um, or borrow that if we take that classification. Genon is very much a Brahmin, or to use another terminology from uh, ancient Gnosticism, he is a pneumatic. He is a person who is devoted to the life of the spirit as opposed to, you know, the the purely psychic or the hylic, the material individual. Evola is very much a Kshatriya. This is my understanding, that he is very much a warrior. It is unfortunate, but Evola suffered an injury in the Second World War. He didn't fight in the Second World War, but he, he was injured. And because of this injury, uh, he took some shrapnel, I think, in his spine. He became paralyzed. And so he spent the rest of his life basically in a chair. And despite that, he remained a kind of warrior. And so one of his most accessible books is a collection of essays entitled The Metaphysics of War. This is a very, very accessible book. Revolt Against the Modern World is perhaps less accessible, but it still, it still is most important. But if you just want to jump in to uh, Evola and see what he's like, this is an excellent um, entry point for you. These were originally written in the 1930s and the 40s, and they deal with war from the spiritual and heroic perspective. So the heroic perspective is also extremely important for uh, Evola. And he looks at examples from the Roman tradition, from the Islamic, from the Iranian, uh, from the Nordic tradition to demonstrate how traditionalists can prepare themselves to experience war in a way that will allow them to overcome the limited possibilities offered by our materialistic and degraded age, thereby transcending the age of Kali and entering the world of heroism. That's just taken from the blurb on the back. So this is very, very accessible. Evola also, before his, his um, debilitating accident uh, or injury was also an avid mountain climber so along with the metaphysics of war a very accessible book published by inner traditions rochester vermont is meditations on the peaks mountain climbing as metaphor for the spiritual quest spiritual quest so you have to understand that the modern world is a world which, again, is completely opposed to spirituality, and therefore it, in, in, in many ways, completely and totally lacks the dimension of depth or height, that is to say, a third dimension. And so it's in that sense that mountain climbing, as climbing, as ascent, is a metaphor for the spiritual ascent. So there's some beautiful essays in this, such as the spirituality of the mountain, the valley of the wind, meditations on the peaks, that's a separate standalone essay in this book from which it takes the title, uh, from which the title of the book is taken. So um, 
these are probably the most accessible books of Evola, and they're of a very sort of spiritual um, nature. Evola had another dimension which distinguishes him very much from René Guénon. Again, he's a Kshatriya. Ah, before we turn to that dimension, another aspect of his Kshatriya character these books are all over my desk here, so please bear with me. Evola, like uh, René Guénon, is also a profound scholar of, of, of spiritual traditions. And in the context of the way of the Kshatriya, he wrote what I think is the most interesting and fascinating and deep and profound work on the original teaching of the Buddha. So this is B Buddhism irrespective of Zen or the Buddhism of the Dalai Lama, Tibet, the Buddhism of Bhutan, the Buddhism of Sri Lanka, what have you. This is the actual teachings of the, of the Buddha based on the earliest Buddhist text, that is to say the Pali Canon. And it's entitled The Doctrine of Awakening, the Attainment of Self-Mastery According to the Earliest Buddhist Texts. This is a true masterpiece. It's an absolutely ingenious and brilliant uh, study and analysis of the oldest uh, text of Buddhism, of the Pali uh, Canon. And so he sees the path of the Buddha as ideal for the Kshatriya, for the warrior. And if you know about uh, the history and lore of, of Buddhism and the Buddha, the individual who was the sage of the Shakyas, Shakyamuni Siddhartha Gautama, who becomes the Buddha, he was of the Kshatriya caste. And I, I really, this is probably one of my favorite books of Evola. In fact, this is the first book of Evola that I actually actually read. So before we move on to this other dimension uh, of, of, of uh, Evola that distinguishes him very much from, from uh, Genon, let's speak a little bit more about uh, another important study he did of a religion or religious tradition, and that is the Yoga of Power. Tantra, Shakti, and the Secret Way, or if you prefer the American pronunciation, Tantra, Shakti, and the Spiritual Way. This is also a very profound study of the Tantric Yoga, the so-called left-hand path, which in the Indic tradition is considered as being absolutely one of the most... Um, efficacious means of spiritual realization in the Kali Yuga. As they say, with great power comes great responsibility. So this is also a very dangerous path. And I think that there's just a lot of nonsense written in English about Tantra. And I think if this is the only book you read about that particular spiritual modality of the Vedic tradition, then your time would not have been wasted. So this is um, just as profound and insightful as Evola's book on Buddhism, The Doctrine of Awakening. He also has some works on spiritual traditions of the West, such as the uh, Mystery of the Holy Grail, the Grail Quest. So he has this book, The Mystery of the Grail, Initiation and Magic in Quest of the Spirit. This is also a, an extremely profound uh, work on this Western uh, mythic cycle. He also has probably one of the most profound books on alchemy, which is here, The Hermetic Tradition, Symbols and Teachings of the Royal Art. Um, so again, I'm being a little bit uh, maybe extremely concise on some of these titles, but I do want to go through all of them and at least put them out there. A lot of people are just not even familiar with these books. And naturally, we all have our favorites, and so some of these books uh, are more dear to me maybe than others, and each person will have their own reaction when they read Evola or any other author. Evola also was involved with magic, and he has a set of books, in fact, called Introduction to Magic, Rituals and Practical Techniques for the Magus, Julius, Evola, and the Ur group. So this is not just Evola, but there's, this is a group of, of people who wrote on the Western magical tradition. When this book came out, there was only one volume. I think two others have come out, so there's three in all. Again, all of the books I've mentioned so far with the exception of The Cinnabar Path and Metaphysics of War, are published by Inner Traditions in Rochester, Vermont. Finally, on uh, religions and spirituality, uh, Evola has this book, which has only come out recently, or I only acquired recently. Let's see what year did this one come out. This is also Inner Traditions. Okay, so 20 English translation, 2021. This is pretty recent. He wrote a whole study about the fall of spirituality, the corruption of tradition in the modern world. So um, if you look around, there's all sorts of esoteric groups and traditions and so-called gurus out there, the so-called New Age movement. And this is Genon's uh, study of that. Uh, and um, he goes at length about how you distinguish between a genuine tradition and a genuine teaching and a fraudulent one. Right. So now 
what really distinguishes, as I was saying earlier, before I got off on all of those other points about uh, Evola, is that Evola is very different from Agenon in another way. He was very much involved in politics uh, in some degree or another. Many people characterize him as a fascist in the in the actual Italian sense. He he was Italian, if, if you didn't notice that or if I didn't mention that yet. And he did have a brief association with uh, Mussolini that didn't last very long. Um, you can read about that at some length in this book, Men Among the Ruins. So these are the reflections of Evola on the post-war world, or the world which came into being after the Second World War. Just to give you some insights, so from the back of the book, the blurb on the back, it says that, um, you know, this text is Evola's frontal assault on the predominant materialism of our time and the mirage of progress. So in a way, it's a kind of a companion volume to Revolt Against the Modern World, except it really addresses very contemporary issues. And, and um, Genon died in 1950-something, so Evola lived a lot longer, and um, he spoke quite openly about a lot of these modern uh, tendencies about democracy. He has some very insightful essays on America and about things that were happening in the U.S. This is an extremely important testament also of his ideas having to do with uh, the modern uh, phenomenon of politics, economics. One of the most interesting portions in this is the occult war and weapons of the occult war. There's an appendix in this in which, uh, appendix to this book in which we have um, Evola's uh, defense, his um, defense of his, um, well, you, you can look into that. Um, so, this is uh, another um, collection of his another collection of his essays uh, on all sorts of topics is the bow and the club. There's some fascinating essays in this book, such as the psychoanalysis of skiing. That's got to be one of my favorites. The decay of words, the concept of initiation, subliminal influences and intelligent stupidity. One aspect of uh, Evola that uh, some people find um, very uncomfortable is that he was also a theorist of race. And he had a very detailed work in which he looked at the doctrines of race and so-called racism. And this is actually a very uh, well done study entitled The Myth of the Blood, in which Genon does not really, Genon, excuse me, in which Evola does not put forward his own opinion, but really looks at the history of different theories of race and racism in Europe. Now, Evola then offered his own understanding, a traditionalist understanding of race, which um, in which he has the view that, you know, there was such a thing as race, especially in previous yugas, that now it's not such a dominant thing, and that there's a notion of a kind of spiritual race that's very closely related to traditional ideas of caste. But again, you have to read that. That is a book which I don't have. It was recently translated. It's called Synthesis of the Doctrine of Race, and the book The Myth of the Blood is a kind of build-up to that. And uh, that uh, I ordered that sometime ago, and it got lost. It never reached me, so I, I don't really know what happened to that, but I'm still trying to um, get a hold of that book. I actually have a PDF of it, but I don't like reading PDFs. So in that book, he does put forward his kind of metaphysical conception or understanding of race. In that regard, he's very similar to another author. Perhaps we should do a video on him as well. Um, he, I really don't like him as much. He was also associated with Genon. His name is uh, Frithjof Schwann. I think Schwann is compromised and compromised himself in many ways because of some alleged acts of uh, moral turpitude and debauchery. Uh, I do say alleged, so I think he compromised himself somewhat, but that doesn't mean that everything he wrote is complete garbage. And he wrote a very interesting treatise entitled Castes and Races. If you can find that somewhere, that's worth looking at. So Evola was very much involved with commenting on uh, the politics of his day and the political movements that uh, he witnessed himself and lived through. Um, one of the interesting books in this regard is Evola's a take on National Socialism. And so this, and, and the Third uh, Reich. So this is his notes on the Third uh, Reich. Um, these are extremely sophisticated works and essays. They're not in any way some sort of lunatic fringe kind of writing at least i don't i don't think so but again you have to read these to and, and come to your own conclusion so the short answer is yet yeah, no uh, julius evolo was not um a nazi he was not a national socialist he is a if anything a radical traditionalist so he is opposed to any sort of doctrines that glorify uh, non-aristocratic values anyhow so he he cannot really be in favor of anything like socialism whether it's that the well-known form of socialism or national socialism, which was in opposition to that. Then he has this uh, selected essays under the title, um, the sort of 
uh, generalized theme of, of, of fascism where a traditionalist confronts fascism. And he has another volume in this regard which has to be seen together. It's called Fascism Viewed from the Right. So he did see some positive aspects of uh, fascism in his day in as much as he saw it as a um, possibility of sort of aristocratic kind of, again, kshatriya kind of uh, values. But again, uh, I don't want to go into too much. You have to read the book and I don't want this video to be too long. I think everyone should read these and come to their own conclusions. In Fascism Viewed from the Right, Evola analyzes the fascist movement of Italy, which he himself uh, had experienced firsthand. And he criticizes it well. And the fascinating thing about this is this is fascism viewed from the right. In other words, an ide a political ideology which is already seen as right wing, and he sees himself as even to the right of that. There's actually a very interesting video about this by another uh, on another channel channel which I saw, and I have no problem in in referring you to that. It's um uh, there's a guy named Michael Millerman, and he did a video on this, and in fact he did one on his notes on the Third Reich as well, wasn't it? So that, that's worth looking at. So Traditionalist Confronts Fascism. This is the companion volume to Fascism Viewed from the Right and Notes on the Third Reich. And it contains many of uh, Evola's various essays on the topic of fascism viewed from the point of view of tradition. So these three go together. So Evola also has a book entitled The Metaphysics of Power. This again is also a collection on any number of uh, topics ranging from the state to education to family to liberty to monarchy to uh, empire, aristocracy. These haven't been translated before. Now again, most of the books with these very nice covers, I really like the covers. These covers, the one on the bow and the club, these are all published by Arctos. And because Arctos publishes all sorts of books, uh, some of them have been banned from Amazon in our age of cancel culture. And, you know, on the one hand, there's supposed to be complete freedom of speech in the United States. Yet, on the other hand, you have this kind of nonsense going on. And I think they, you know, one of the people that they kind of got in, maybe in trouble, so to speak, for is Alexander Dugan, given the recent American adventures taking place in Ukraine, in this proxy war between NATO and and Russia and a sort of new emerging world order, which they don't want to emerge. And so they publish a lot of the writings of Alexander Dugan. And apparently you can't buy any of those on Amazon or even on Barnes and Noble anymore. So you may not be able to order these for very long if they actually completely shut down. But the metaphysics of power is really one of the most interesting collection of essays by Evola. Also in this vein is the last book of Evola to appear in his lifetime, and it's a collection of writings that he uh, composed uh, throughout his life, and he collected them together before his death under the title of Recognitions, Studies on Men and Problems from the Perspective of the Right. This is an extremely important book if you consider that this is the last distillation of his intellectual legacy, which he prepared under his own supervision just before his death. So obviously this is the, the, the distillation of his life's work. There's a great range of essays here. And just to give you a smattering, maybe we can come in on the, the table of contents here. Can you focus on that just for a minute? So there's a lot of stuff there. There's even studies on the, you know, Zen Buddhism, the left-hand path, the myth, myth of future regality, etc., etc. A lot of things in here. Yeah, there's 40 different essays. There's even one on the Emperor Julian, which is pretty interesting. There's an essay on Genon as well. I've already said many times how important Genon is. Now, the last book on this list is... Oh, we forgot one, didn't we? We forgot a um, handbook for right-wing youth. So this is um, also just a collection of his essays. This was not really compiled by Evola. This was assembled out of Evola's writings by a uh, Hungarian uh, traditionalist and right-wing figure. Uh, but again, I, it does not bother me. I read whatever is available uh, of the writings of, of Evola. I'm, I find him to be a fascinating figure. And it doesn't matter to me who publishes uh, what. You know, I'm interested in reading the books and understanding him. Okay, so the last book on the list is Ride the Tiger, a survival manual for the aristocrats of the soul. This is probably his least accessible book, and it is, a, it is uh, in my view, and you may not agree with me, but this is a rather strange work in that um, he takes uh, as his uh, starting point European nihilism 
and tries to espouse a way or a method whereby so-called aristocrats of the soul, people who are not on board with the modern deviation to survive in the modern world. Now this is again a, a point of departure between Evola and Genon. Genon believed that you had to be part of a tradition, and not just any tradition, but a tradition in which initiation was still alive and well. Because the only way toward uh, liberation, so to speak, a true intellectual or noetic activity or response to the decay and dissolution and deliquescence around us is to tread such a spiritual path for which initiation is absolutely necessary. But initiation is not readily available. Evola did not have the same sort of positive view of the Catholic Church which Genon did until which is throughout his writings. There is maybe some indication that maybe in, in some of his later writings that um, his uh, hostility uh, towards the Catholic Church may have softened what, but he, he never became a practicing Catholic again. I, I'm sure he was raised as a Catholic, being an Italian. But it's not clear whether he actually had an initiation or not. There's a very weird book, I forget the title of it now, ex I mean, I forget the exact title, that alleges that uh, that Evola took some sort of, a, had some sort of an initiation into Sufism at the hands of Genon, which I just find almost just uh, absolutely impossible. But anyways, there's a figure who has made this allegation and claims that he knew uh, Evola and he wrote a whole book about it which uh, which is available. I have um, an ebook version of that. I really don't know what to make make of it. I, I find it very hard to believe and he has and that book consists of dialogues between this individual and Evola and it just doesn't sound like him. Uh, but anyhow, I could be wrong. But as far as we can understand, you know, Evolo did not have an initiation and he was looking for some sort of a path outside of religion. And so he has this book, Ride the Tiger. And it's not, a, the reason I say it's kind of a strange book is it's not really clear how it is that in a practical day-to-day -day sense, you actually ride the tiger. But nevertheless, uh, I think it's 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 worth reading, and um, it's not a huge issue for me uh, because you know I I'm a Muslim, I'm in the Muslim tradition, I have initiation, and so I know what to do. But um, I think he was really trying to write a book for people who who don't have access to that. But I would maintain that anyone who truly uh, seeks will find, and that path would be sooner or later made available to that individual. Anyway, not to dwell on that any further, there is one final, um, there is a study on Evola by a person who did know him, who did interview him. He's an Italian journalist. His name is uh, G Gianfranco de Torres, is one of the foremost scholars on Baron Julius Evola, a journalist for both radio and television. He is the author of more than 20 books in Italian, both fiction and nonfiction, as well as many artistic and political essays. He has been awarded the Italian Prize for Science Fiction 11 times. He lives in Rome. So this is a very important study by this journalist of Evola. And it is, sorry, it's entitled Julius Evola here. It's got a really cool picture of him. And it says, The Philosopher and Magician in War. It's 1939 to 1945. So this is um, a very key period in the life of Evola. And we're very fortunate that this uh, 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 man took the time to meet with Evola and uh, write this extremely important volume. And there's a picture of the author, Gianfranco de Turris, with the Baron in his, what looks like his study. So that completes my... Um, list of books by Genon. Like I said, there's one or two which I don't have here. I would really like to get a copy of Synthesis of the Doctrine of Race, but I haven't been able to secure a copy. And the other title which I don't have is his book called Pagan Imperialism. This whole list which I've gone through does not exhaust all of the writings of, of, of Evola. He was very prolific, and I'm sure there's other things in Italian which are out there which haven't been translated. He wrote for all sorts of journals. He started different journals and magazines in his lifetime, and I don't think that there has been a complete works of Evola uh, compiled. Um, if, if there is, maybe it's in Italian, but all of those, suffice it to say that, that his complete oeuvre all of his works, the totality of his writings, have never been completely translated into English. But this is everything that's available, uh, everything that I have, and it's really worth reading. He was um, a man of profound insight, 
and uh, even and the English translations they read beautifully in English. He's he's a far more accessible than than Genon, who wrote very difficult French, and 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 that's clear in the English as well. So these two uh, traditionalist thinkers, Genon and Evola, are are absolute the twin pillars of traditionalism. And there are important differences between them. I've tried to shed some light on those, but that's just scratching the surface. Obviously, you have to read these books and spend some time with them. And, and in the final analysis, do come to your own conclusions. I have started already a course on um, a course of video lectures devoted to uh, the reign of quantity and the signs of the times by René Guénon. And I'm in the process of making a little announcement here of doing the same for uh, Evola, pro most probably his revolt against the modern world. Um, and um, for that, just uh, stay tuned. If you are interested in that, let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. This video has been longer than I thought, but there were a lot of books to go through. I really hope you find it useful. And once again, thank you for watching. I left out one of the very important works of Evola, and so I'm just doing this as an epilogue. Uh, and that is his book, Eros and the Mysteries of Love, The Metaphysics of Sex. I should have mentioned this video maybe when I was talking about the yoga of power, when I was uh, when I mentioned how the all the distortions of of of, uh, of tantra which we find in Western writings. This is an extremely important study of the concept of of eros across the religious traditions of the world, and naturally the topic of sex is one which uh, uh, with which the Western world, the modern world, is extremely obsessed. And in this regard, uh, the great deviation among other figures can. Be be traced back to Freud. And there are others, but Freud, Sigmund Fraud, as I like to call him. And so, uh, and, and Evola does mention that in, in the introduction to that book. There is also a um, another study which is uh, not irrelevant to the subject, which is uh, entitled The Perversion of Normality. Um, you may have a look at that as well uh, while reading Evola. So that is also worth looking at. So I'm sorry I missed that title, uh, but uh, I've added it now to the list. Thanks.